so Gamergate was, uh, it was a big scandal that rocked the video game industry in 2014. Uh, it initially started with a woman, a uh, feminist YouTuber by the name of Anita Sarkeesian, being targeted for uh, producing a, a video series called uh, Tropes Versus Women, just looking at the way women were reflexively treated in the video game industry. Um, for that, she received rape threats, death threats. Uh, she had people making games where they uh, beat up her face. And I'm not just talking about like, I'm going to kill you, ha, 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 lol. I'm talking specific, credible threats on her life. Things like sending bomb threats to venues where she was going to speak, where it had to be canceled and SWAT teams had to be brought in. That playbook was then copied over to Zoe Quinn. It was then copied over to me. Um, so I want for you to imagine, like, it's not just having literally thousands of Twitter accounts explaining how they're going to rape and murder you every single day. It's having people send you fanfic fantasies, how they're going to keep you alive and cut the skin off your body and make you feel it to uh, like posting your home address with like maps of how people should come in and uh, kill everyone in the house, like the path they should go through. Um, it was having my bank account hacked. It was having my game studio uh, targeted by sabotaging the ratings of the things we were selling. It was just absolute total war. You could draw a direct line from Gamergate to everything you're talking about because it's the same people with Mike Flynn. And additionally, you know, Russia, Russia took many of these disinformation yes. tools and used it for information warfare against our own country. It's extremely important for me to tell the story that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal because I first said it, not actually in 99, but in 2000. There were two awful things that happened. Um, Yeltsin, towards the end of it, Yeltsin had been a great and good man, and then he drank himself into a kind of awful alcoholic senility. And his family was corrupt. And there's a moment when um, he gives the crown or the key to the Kremlin to Vladimir Putin, who's a nobody. He just looks like a cheap secret policeman in a nasty suit. It's a reversion back to the Soviet time. It's an awful mistake. And his polling number's like 2%. And somebody said, this isn't going to work unless something extraordinary happens. And then something extraordinary did happen. Chechen terrorists blew up a series of apartment blocks in southern Russia and in Moscow, killing around 300 people. And then Putin goes out and said, we're going to wipe these um, these bastards out on the shitter in gangster speak because he's a gangster. Or did that happen? The reality is, and I think the evidence for this is overwhelming, is that the Moscow apartment bombs blown up in September 1999 were a black operation by the KGB slash FSB that effectively Vladimir Putin blew up Russia, blamed it on the Chechens, launched the Second Chechen War, which the Russian army uh, prosecuted with a pitiless barbarity. And so Vladimir Putin's original sin is murdering fellow Russians to make him look good. The, the pattern, unfortunately, that seems to underlie a lot of the, the most enthusiastic Russian propagandists is that they have been dealing with severely damaged personalities and personal failure for most of their lives. In fact, the overlap between the number of Russian propagandists who uh, also turn out to be convicted sex offenders is absolutely startling. There are yeah. some deep-seated fund first fundamental personality flaws that actually predispose people to being uh, available to be made use of by Russia. And if you look back at the, the KGB handbooks for recruiting agents of influence, agents of subversion, or indeed propagandists, then you can see very clearly that Russia understood the misfits make the good targets, the people with a grudge, the people who feel they've been treated unfairly by the world because they've been consistent failures, and therefore seek revenge. 
and you can see that revenge coming through so strongly in some of the the verbal attacks that you hear from the trolls from the so-called independent journalists the ones pushing the russian propaganda lines because the bile and the vitriol and the hatred that they pour out when they're talking about people who criticize russia it's extremely personal and it's plainly deep tapping deeply into their own personality defects I can give you an, an example of how I see Russia and their propaganda uh, way of thinking. Imagine you are in a bar, yeah, and you have a nice uh, time with your friends, and you just having fun. And there is always a guy in the bar who is just staring at you. And he already wants to fight with you, and everybody know it, you know, and you can pretend he is not there. You can pretend like you are avoiding him, la, la, la. but there is only two ways to solve this question. Or you ending your beautiful evening with friends and just leaving, which will be smart if you are able to do that. Or you need to fight this bully. <laughs> there is only one uh, chance to do it. And with Russia propaganda channels, uh, you need to make them forbidden. It's lie. It's just lies. They're ruining the world. According to Aristotle, when you are saying lie, you're creating world which doesn't exist and you put people into world which doesn't exist so and one woman will realize uh, that it was not true they need to build the, their world from a scratch and that's why dante put uh, traitors in the worst place of hell because they are creating a world which doesn't exist and force people to live in a world which doesn't exist Uh, what we see in your movie is that people are being algorithmically manipulated, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're being dragged down these rabbit holes. Another thing, and you didn't really get into this much in the movie, is the manipulation of the algorithm to drive advertising dollars, which is something I'm mm. very interested in. Mm. And also... Since you're an old web guy, I'm sure you understand the implication <laughs> of bots mm -hmm. and how bots can be used to manipulate manipulate online voting, etc. Sure. What if there's an you know what if someone has a bot that can generate artificial views for these channels? Mm -hmm. All right. Sure, it's um, a different. I mean, I'll can I unpack those one by one because there's a yes. Sure. Okay. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I would actually argue that we spend a lot of time talking about the algorithm and we spend yeah. a lot of time talking about the algorithm's relationship to advertising and monetization. Um, I obviously I'm aware that there are issues with the algorithm. I think that the problem that we have run into now is that um, it's it's as you know, being a technology, it is such a catch all phrase. Right. Mm -hmm. And the public doesn't. really. Yes. Um, so they, they keep saying, just fix the algorithm, just fix the algorithm. And to be fair to Google and YouTube, they've done a lot of work on the algorithm. You, it's actually much harder. The recommended, not to bog people down too much in technology stuff, but the recommended algorithm has been changed significantly since when it was first introduced by YouTube. And sure, um, it's hard to tell a company that has an algorithm that is driving more views because people are more attracted to hateful content and violent content than they are to you know, more compassionate or humane content, which is a, a, an obvious fact that's been driving advertising since the dawn of man. Sex and violence is, you know, is more appealing to the <laughs> and magnetic to the average human than, you know, talking about how much we care about each other. Um, and we talk about that actually a great deal in the film. Yes. The issue is that we don't have uh, practical solutions, I don't think that at the moment that are being addressed to these technology companies that irrefutably uh, lay accountability at their feet for the power of their platforms. And when we just say, tweak your algorithm, their response to that, and it's a very easy one, is like, okay, we will. And then everyone goes away for five more years. And there's 20 more school shootings and like a yeah. whole ton of people get killed. And we have rioting in the streets. When you've still got Steven Crowder on a massive platform on YouTube after the FBI uh, you know, executed their warrant on Mar-a-Lago, calling for war on his Twitter account to his millions of followers. That's a parasocial problem. That's not an algorithmic problem. Um, okay, so that's so here's, my my hard here's my follow-up. How about regulation? Where are the yeah, laws? Yeah, yeah. 
We, well, Technology think, moves at the speed of light. Our regulation, our legislation moves at the speed of old white dudes. <laughs> I would say it's worse than that. Um, I, I, you know, and again, we, we get into this in the film. So I'd say our whole third act is about this very question. Um, I, I, from my perspective, diving into this world, um, it's, and I know you don't think this way, but I think it's giving the, it's giving the Congress too much credit to just say they move slowly. It's, it's, there's so much dark money. Uh, there's yeah. so much lot, so much lobbying. We agree. Power. Yeah. People, you know, when you're dealing with a company the size of Google, it's not just the right that's getting bought. The left is getting bought. Everyone's being yeah. told to just shut up and sit on their hands. So yes. there is no antitrust. There is no legislation being presented. There is no reform. There is no regulation. There's literally nothing happening. So my final question for you is, I mean, you had people from the I am cult messing with your head. You had people from Eric Prince's groups messing with you, setting you up. What would you say, not to the people who ran the ops, but the people behind that? the people who pay for these operations, the people who cause this chaos, the, the big money, the, the billionaires, what would you say to them today? I would say that you're, you're putting your own future in danger. And I don't mean that in the sense of, ah, Johnny Law is going to come and arrest you. It, it's, you're putting your life in danger the same way the existence of billionaires and massive income inequality puts people in danger. You're putting people in danger by uh dismantling and destroying groups that are going to do something about climate change like nobody is an island and the worst things get like i'm i'm a believer that things evolve over time uh whether it's music politics anything else and what these people are doing is they're trying to freeze this moment in time so that those who have the most power and the most money will continue having the most power and the most money it's rent seeking um, but the problem is, as if you don't change, pressure builds up and eventually it explodes. Um, so that's I mean, that's to me, it's the basics of why you want a democratic system is that it's a pressure valve for injustices that happen in society. And if you destroy people that point out the injustice and you destroy people that try and fix it, you're eventually left with a grotesque, unjust society where eventually it just explodes. That's despite the fact that the, the government has actually passed legislation relating to elections in the UK. It's chosen not to prevent that type of activity, the overseas interference uh, that we highlighted, which is deeply disturbing. It tells you really how rotten uh, British politics is nowadays. The, the government has taken a deliberate decision to continue to allow the framework for overseas interference in elections. And the second really disturbing thing that, that, I, that I thought about uh, about the 2018 clip that, that, that he showed was that, remember, that was after the 2016 Brexit referendum. It was after the uh, election of Donald Trump in 2016. And yet we had a senior Facebook executive telling me that he'd never thought about overseas interference in elections, something that was a massive issue after the 2016 um, US presidential election. So I think there's been a lack of candor and honesty from the tech giants. And the, the early conclusion that I took, uh, uh, that I drew from all of this, is that just as we, re we regulate elections quite tightly in the UK, historically, we've always had very closely regulated and, and fair elections. Now, that has completely gone out of the window in the past 10 years. And we have this ungoverned space, which is social media, which is beyond the, the legal uh, ambit of, of the, the people who run elections in this country. And the government is allowing that to continue. One of the real problems here, I think, has been these investigations by the FBI 
have been all criminal investigations when they should have been counterintelligence investigations. Yes. That was McGonagall's job. Is it okay for the President of the United States to have made a fortune uh, laundering money for the Russian mafia? No. Shouldn't that be a scandal? Or would we just... You would think. You, you would think. think. Doesn't that compromise you? And it certainly does in terms of national security. And that's what counterintelligence is about. And the FBI failed miserably. And what's important here is that the, the talking point is that we are not interested in, in any of those people in the major cities. We are going into the depths of the countryside. We are going outside these urban centers. We are going into the, into the culture of the non-elite. Right? You hear things very similar to this kind of talk that's been prevalent in, uh, among nationalist groups in the Russian Federation for a while now. You hear some very similar uh, cadences, I would put it this way, among uh, really public intellectuals in the U.S. who have uh, allied themselves very, very closely with the January 6th crowd and the Stop the Steal movement. We do not, we are not interested in what bi-coastal elites are doing. We don't want to hear, even from those Midwestern American cities, those people who live in Detroit and Chicago and Cleveland, they can all take a flying leap we want to go to the forgotten person, the forgotten man, the forgotten woman. Invariably, in far-right discussions, this is the forgotten white man and the forgotten white woman. Mm -hmm. Precisely that sequence also. So that, I would say, my first priority, and I know more about this, so that maybe that's why, we need accountability for some of those basic things that sitting politicians are doing um, immediately. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so you brought up the Ohio Republican Party violating the Constitution on, uh, you know, voting maps. Mm -hmm. I would point out that in the state of Ohio, the way our educational funding is done has been unconstitutional and ruled unconstitutional for what decades now mm -hmm. where's uh, the accountability for that case. yeah it's only 20 there isn't i mean that's the problem we okay. have and i so people will hear me sometimes and assume man that guy's super partisan no i'm actually and i may be in moments but i'm actually a lawyer and the reason this bothers me more than anything else is as a lawyer we have in ohio a legislature that ignored the ohio supreme court around school funding we have a legislature that ignored the Ohio Supreme Court multiple times around illegal maps. We have a son who's a sitting Supreme Court justice ruling in cases involving his dad, the governor, not recusing, but ruling in his favor. Like This is a five alarm fire of the rule of law. And as a lawyer, like I'm about to get, you know, as a lawyer, you get 24 hours of classes every two years for continuing legal education. I'm, that costs some money. I'm like, I'm going to do it, but at some point, your your law license becomes less meaningful if you're in a state where the rule of law is is literally disappearing. And I would I would argue, and this is what I do in the Z generation book, that this is a postmodern phenomenon of life in Russia. They're not going going back to the 1500s, the state and Russian society is exploiting the fact that the internet makes reality malleable. And that's what you guys talk about all the time on here when you talk about QAnon, that we can live in alternative realities. I've, I've just been rereading, re oh, you can't see it because uh, it's, it's blocking this out beautifully. I've just been rereading uh, Simulations by Baudrillard, which is a very complicated work of French philosophy. But if you want to get your head around the complete collapse of the distinction between reality and what we would call as scholars mediatized reality that is the reality that is fed to us or consumed to us virtually then Baudrillard is where you go and if we simply say Russians are living like 
they are in the 1500s, then we would say, well, actually, they're not connected to the outside world. They're not connected to each other. They're living, in a sense, they're living outside of history and they're living outside of ideas like nationhood, for example, which effectively for most people did not exist in the 1500s. No, Russians are very attached to the world through the internet. They are very attached to the idea of some sense of Russian nationhood. But those things can be very distorted and made very flexible thanks to the way that in particular social media functions. We're in serious trouble on climate. Um, as you know, this is like I put up wind turbines. I've been intellectually, emotionally, professionally intertwined with this issue for over 20 years. And I've always told people around the mid 2020s is when life is going to start getting bad. Um, we cannot continue forward like this. The crops only have to fail once uh, for everything to become a disaster. And crops, like many other things, are based on predictable, stable weather patterns that we've had for thousands of years. Um, and there's also, there's no ironclad rule in physics that says it can't be 150 degrees outside. There's nothing that says that. Now, we, we will not survive that, but there's no like rule that says the earth has to be habitable for humans. Right. And we, we need to recognize it and we need to understand that this is going to require sacrifice from everybody. Um, it's going to realistically, I, I know nobody wants to talk about it. It's going to lead to a decline in living standards for everybody. It's going to lead to less personal autonomy for everybody because you're not going to be able to have a car to drive around. Maybe you will, if you live in rural America or something, but the number of people with cars and cities and, and tourist flights to and from places. I mean, we put an enormous amount of carbon into the atmosphere and it's either we change or we're going to die. And it's, it's not a matter of me wanting to, to like put down or keep down certain groups of people from celebrating and having fun and doing the stuff they've always done. It, it's like, it's like we're in a car, okay? And that car is going 100 miles an hour. And we're in the back seat. And the guy in the front seat driving is fucking drunk. Jack Daniels in one hand, a pistol in the other. And he's like, we got one more house to go to. We're going to go pick up some weed and some Coke and other stuff. And you're like, dude, let me out of this car. Uh, but they're not going to let you out of the car. Like, we have actual dangerous lunatics in charge of our countries and it's not just the united states it's everywhere and it's at every level because they keep imagining that somebody is going to come save us there will be a miracle technology uh that we suddenly make that will happen like jesus will come down or aliens will come down and the reality is none of that is going to happen what's going to happen is physics is going to happen and physics and math are predictable and it's all, it's bad all the way down. Like if, you, if you're worried about food inflation, and this is my fear for the 2024 election, you're going to have food inflation because there will be less food and more people. And this will continue no matter who is president, no matter who is in charge, because we have massively fucked up our environment. have tried to achieve a, a just snapshots of the here and now of when it was recorded uh, and a lot of those albums all of them lean to the politics politics of that time and UK Grimm isn't any different really you know our, our government has completely broken down it's um it's like a headless snake it's 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 it doesn't know what it's doing it's it's completely out of control it's, it's transparently corrupt uh, and um, it's really weighing heavy on on the psychology of of the the, the English public, the the country, really. Why will this go down uh, as a turning point in history, and one that's as significant as, for example, the end of the USSR in, in 1991? It's because it's not only for the future shape of Europe; it actually is determinant for the future shape of Russia itself. Because as we've discussed previously in the past, 
Up until now, Russia has had no reason to stop and think that there is any preferable path to trying to reassert itself as an empire and to carry out these military adventures, trying to, to conquer its neighbors. Because fairly uh, consistently, since particularly the end of the, the USSR, it's been successful in doing that. It's been successful in trying to reassert itself in its neighborhood. And it's found time and again that military adventurism actually brings benefits, which are far in excess of the costs. So it in Moldova, no. in Georgia, in, yeah. Russia, in 2014, it works. Now, what Russia hasn't had is the kind of decisive strategic setback that would challenge that thinking, that would make people in Moscow and across the rest of Russian society think, well, actually, maybe that was a bit of a mistake. Because whenever you look at the, the trajectory of any post-imperial power, and it doesn't matter which you choose, it's, it is actually consistent across the board, whether it's uh, Britain, France, Portugal, etc. They all have this defining moment at which the boundaries of their power are set. And there is a strategic shock, a strategic setback, where there's a sudden realization, not just within the centers of power, but across society, that they cannot exert power in the way they could previously. Now, for, for the UK, that was the Suez crisis in, in 1956, where they couldn't proceed without US backing, effectively. For France, it was Algeria in 1962, right. Portugal 1974. There's always been right. this moment which starts a process of national reappraisal and starts this very long process right. of finding a new role in the world. Russia hasn't had that. And one of the things that Ukraine might be able to do for us all, and also for Russia itself as well, is provide that moment. Multimedia is a powerful social factor in defining whether this specifically influence someone's behavior in a particular direction, in a commercial or political sense. It's not an exact science. Uh, I would agree with you completely, uh, and I think that uh, establishing the efficacy of, of five-factor modeling or any other kind of modeling is incredibly difficult. Uh, you can certainly gather um, enough reports that will come down on either side as to whether this is effective or whether this is not effective. Um, what I would say is the effectiveness of it um, should not have an impact on the pursuit of under uh, uh, the, the pursuit of illegality, um, if data has been gathered illegally, if if someone has gathered a lot of data illegally and then what they've done with it is a mess and doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It's still illegal. Um, if I uh, attempt to murder somebody and I'm just really bad at murder, I'm still an attempted murderer. Uh, I'd like you to tell our viewers a little bit more about what was happening in that clip. So what was happening there is it was an investigation into the work of Cambridge Analytica in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago was a dry run before uh, Cambridge Analytica's work on Brexit and uh, before their work um, in the United States on the Trump campaign. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, which doesn't roll off the tongue very well, does it? Um, the What's interesting there is the leading parties are divided by ethnicity, and there are African immigrants historically and Asian immigrants historically, and these two parties are divided. Um, what the campaign that Cambridge Analytica ran uh, was a campaign to get people to not vote, don't vote. That was the whole idea. And they tried to make it look like a grassroots campaign, a uh, street level campaign. They even graffitied parliament uh, in, in the course of this. And it was all about don't vote. But what they knew from having done um, ethnographic surveys is they knew that on the day of the vote, that sure enough, uh, people from the uh, African immigrant community who said they wouldn't vote didn't vote, but that the Asian kids would do what their parents told them to, and they'd turn up and vote. And so the part, the whole thing swung um, for that party, uh, and they managed to change change the government. Between all of your projects. Uh... Active Measures, American PSYOP, Search for Q, 
and uh, lawyers, guns and money. Is there like a connective tissue between all of them that uh, that you can see? Because I can. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think for me, they all deal with something that is both has two elements for, for me, uh, maybe less so the Q one, but but the other ones that there's an, there's an interest, a very interesting story going on and a very important one at the same time that the the inner drama that's happening is is fascinating, but it's also incredibly relevant to a broader political espionage uh, corruption element. Um, but, but you might have a better, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just see it as ongoing assaults on democracy. Yeah. What, whether it's coming from foreign enemy states or it's coming from U S traders within, I see it as multiple fronts on the same war of trying to overthrow liberal democracy. I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the through line. Yes. No, I think it's, well, it's, funny, it's funny you say that because I think that, you know, when I got into uh, working in the space uh, in 2017 was really when I started focused very, very directly on this. Uh, you know, it, it really, you do have, there's so much new information, so many new scenarios that you kind of have to figure out like, what is my true North in this? Like, where do I actually hold my, no, this is good. And if we're fighting for that, that is good. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that's democracy. That, that is actual democratic processes. Right. Uh, and that is the place where I sort of uh, shine my light as my sort of true north of, are, are we working towards a more democratic, uh, more open world? Or are we shutting it down and trying to create authoritarian systems? see these operations across our country, across the globe. Uh, we see the farmers in Poland dumping Ukrainian grain, except they're all flying Russian flags and have signs in Russian. Um, is this a class war? Uh, uh, well, fascism is sometimes described from <clears throat> in, in certain political traditions as oligarchical finance capital backed nationalism to trick the working class. And that's classically what we're seeing. We're seeing the billionaire class fund fascism uh, using homophobia, uh, racism, patriarchy to create what one headline called the rainbow coalition of hate. So it's going to be a multicultural, multiracial movement that is uh, that where, you know, you have white supremacists, anti-Semites, sexists, uh, homophobes, uh, you know, you're going to have, you're going to draw in uh, the Christian, the Christian right, uh, because they're drawn in by the anti-LGBT stuff and the anti-abortion uh, line. Uh, this is familiar from the past. Plenty of people who wouldn't self-describe as fascists, plenty of people who wouldn't describe themselves as white supremacists. They're anti-trans. They're not white supremacists. <laughs> they're, uh, they're, uh, <clears throat> uh, so they're the foot soldiers of hate. The foot soldiers of hate. And each group has its own target that they hate. Muslims, immigrants, uh, you know. So we're going to have uh, black uh, Trump supporters who don't like immigrants or Muslims or LGBT. We're going to have white Trump supporters who don't, who like his uh, macho posturing or, uh, and domination of black Americans. We're going to have a lot of men who like, you know, who like to see, you know, someone who's been accused multiple times of sexual assault and gets away with it. Someone who uh, we're going to have religious conservatives who like the stacking of the Supreme Court with far right uh, justices who seek to uh, ever constrain women's rights. So uh, so this is this is the situation. And it's all funded by billionaires who want to get rid of regulations so they can uh, so they can plunder the earth and survive climate change in their giant bunkers in Hawaii.
the KGB years, Russia has always considered, maybe even earlier, always consider the uh, the information landscape as a warfare landscape, and this is the way they've been approaching it without any any solution of continuity, right? So, how do they approach this kind of warfare that we are completely oblivious of, not anymore after the pandemic, but we are still pretty much behind in, in you know, uh, in having the, 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 the full consciousness of, of this being a warfare, right? So how do they approach it? They approach it militarily, which means that they work in stages. It's organized in stages, right? So for the next stage of the operation to be successful, you have to erase the trace of what went wrong in the the stage that preceded it, right? You or you 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 know you you uh, bring to an end um, a, a military operation in info warfare, and then that chapter is closed, and you have to go on and you know implement on what you have achieved. In the in the previous stage, so also QAnon has gone through stages, and this is what I see pretty much also like right now with the Dugin, you know, with all these events organized in Italy. Uh, they are, and we are entering one of the first stages of the 2024 warfare for European and USA elections. Why did you put Twitter on here? This is so important. Because well, those are their algorithms. They enable this. They are the ones that enable this. So, for example, what Elon Musk is doing right now with Twitter, he's making, he's enabling all the troll farms that had been disabled before. They weren't able to act on Twitter, but now they're back. And now you can just spending a little bit of money you can promote your disinformation you can promote your troll farm you can do doing social manipulation on social media has never been easier on twitter than it is now wow that's and so the vast terrifying. majority of the trolls have blue checks now these zoomer morons are reading bin laden's letter to america from 20 2001 and saying this is the most eye-opening thing i've ever seen it does scare me a little bit because we've now entered into i've heard it called the post-truth age i would just call it a very kind of um nihilistic moment in american history to be sure also probably international history where you don't have to uh you don't have to hide the worst of yourself all of your your venality, your vindictiveness, your murderous rage, all of the things you would try to cover up if, for instance, you were the Soviet Union. There's no famine here. Our, our gulags are models of re-education and rehabilitation. All of these things, you spend a great deal of energy trying to uh, obfuscate. Now, you don't do that anymore. You lean into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a piece of shit. I want to go out and kill people with AR-15s for the lulls, because it's funny, because it I own the libs by doing that. The salesmanship is, it's, it's all negative. It's not, there's no positive prescription. For many of us um, out here, so I, I wrote a thread, as you can see, de December uh, 30th before telling you know, it, and it goes on to explain in, in detail mm -hmm. sort of how it was going to go. I warned uh, people on the left not to go because they were going to blame it on Antifa. And it was, mm -hmm. gonna, you know, it was very clear exactly what they were planning. There were caravans of people being organized, um, you know, and, and as I said here, at some point, I'm afraid people are going to die. Because they were, that was the, um, the... That was the intent. That was the, the intent. intent. It was the express intent of these people. And all you had to do was watch it. And so for me, the, the, the thing that I cannot get my head around is 
how one, you know, this Twitter guy and some other people figured this out and our entire intelligence, you know, um, infrastructure um, could not warn people like you what was going to happen so that you could protect yourself and the people that work for you. Uh, to me, it's it's just, uh, one of the great mysteries, and and I'm sad that the, the, the points were not connected, that the tips that were not put in were not, um, you know, taken seriously, so that you know a lot of trauma and injuries and death could have been prevented. And I agree with that. I mean, this is the miscommunication or not connecting the dots to to. Uh, Imagine what, you know, the worst case scenario, because, you know, after the election, I think it was November, uh, the following week or immediately after the election, when Trump declared uh, himself the winner without no evidence that he was such, um, he began to plan about this. I remember a um, interview that he did with uh, Chris Wallace a couple of days before the election, I believe. Uh, and where Chris Wallace asked him uh, whether he would go out peacefully uh, if he were to lose the election. And he said, we'll see. And I, I took that as immediately, okay, he's he's not going to leave uh, peacefully. Yep. He's going to, just like he fear, uh, Fury um, antagonist, uh, a speech during his inauguration day that culminated with the American carnage uh, mm -hmm. line on it. That's how he exactly ended up with American carnage at the Capitol. Uh, so he began uh, projecting what would happen if he were the president. And after he lost the election, he decided to uh, claim, uh, hold on to it. going on two years and again i know you never make it about you you always say you're doing your job but it's the people but you know as somebody who knows you watched you know just your your grace when you were here and then watched how you could not wait to get back to ukraine i mean this it still just blows my mind well we're all thank you but we all do our jobs you guys are fighting there which is equally important because it's information warfare and i know that you all three of you spend endless nights sleepless nights fighting the same enemy fighting the information warfare for which i'm very very grateful and at times i can tell you heidi uh it might be easier to confront something physical than the invisible enemy, because here at least it's very clear, the evil is very obvious. It, you cannot argue with it. It's, it's into your face. It kills the surveillance. It's very hard to be or impossible to be on their side. You, you fight in the fight. I, I know I've been into your shoes, I know how difficult what all three of you are doing. There is an invisible enemy sipping into your thoughts, trying to twist every word. And in some ways it's harder. So thank you for doing that. Sounds like a kid's game a little bit. Troll farm sounds, it, it has the nice cute meaning about some small trolls and something virtual who cannot harm you in real life so trolls, green green trolls popping up it's everywhere what come on online bullying isn't real yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trolls when they get angry yeah, yeah. but do that. the problem is if the psychology of and, and your soul and your real life is involved then they can get you to the situation where you you can't see you 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 see no help for yourself anymore, so you are helpless. You you just your life just starts to crumble. No one else, no one knows why. Your resilience sh shrinks. Uh, your family sees someone something is happening to you. No one knows really why. Then you your uh, you suck at work because 
of mental health issues. And then you have, to, or they can arrange for other types of trouble, like financial, and then, then the credibility and everything, all these small, tiny hits together aimed at your main weakness, where you care at most, can get you down. And this it's is what we say, draw farms. It's just coordinated swarms of killers. Yeah. Of soul killers. I just want to give some facts. Uh, you know, fact one is that Peter Thiel was the first investor in Facebook. And uh, after Peter Thiel invested in Facebook, a Russian Israeli named Yuri Milner invested in Facebook. And then a uh, name that you will hear out of me quite often, Sergey Grishin invested $2 billion in Facebook. Uh, during the great hack, if you've seen that movie on Netflix, uh, Palantir actually aided Cambridge Analytica in scraping data from Facebook. Palantir, founded and funded by Peter Thiel, aided Cambridge Analytica to scrape data from Facebook, where Peter Thiel was a board member. I don't know why people can't see that connection, but I want to make sure you know about it. So I, I mentioned the movie, The Great Hack. And you can watch that on Netflix. The other thing I think people need to really, really watch is a, a film from one of our former guests, uh, Data and Disinformation, Investigating Cambridge Analytica. And that's by Charles Creel and Kat yeah. Gellin. Yeah. And in that movie, they talk about how medical data is used yeah. to specifically target people. Yeah, This is important. Your data is being weaponized against you. Why would you give it to a sociopathic billionaire? Other of the, the manner, the energy in Russian and all of this paleo male, paleo conservative uh, disinfo folklore is a misogyny. So I call uh, the CCP, Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, as distinct from the ancient culture of Iran, and MAGA and Brexit, these are the axis, uh, axis of misogyny. Um, and if we see that energy in these memes, and again, it goes back to uh, the international conventions on banning discrimination on the grounds of sex um, and banning discrimination on the, on the grounds of um, gender um, uh, uh, identity or sexual preference or politics. The, this is international law. Um, certainly in terms of sex and political beliefs. And what they're trying to do is um, discriminate against, for instance, half our population, which are women, and to create this, I mean, um, this, what they call the handmaid, handmaid's uh, tale uh, situation. And so that, um, that for me, again, is if you pick up that energy in any meme, then you probably know you're being trolled. So even if you might feel whatever reason um, because, you know, some uh, someone, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, sympathetic or empathetic to the story, if you're picking up this manner of, um, of misogyny from it, it's part of it. And what I noticed with the, the, the Pat Buchanan thing is because the question I was wondering was what ties all of these uh, oligarchs together? Uh, because it's more than compromat, meaning, you know, they've got pictures in the shower or something, but the compromat, and this is the brilliant uh, idea I got from Peter Dukes from Byline Times, where actually the compromise, the compromise, what your vulnerability is, you want uh, um, power, uh, you, 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 you want your workers, no restrictions on your workers, uh, you want to build the handmaid's tail yeah. place. You're um, a sociopath. And yeah. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it could be short, that, right? I, ideologically, they and because of that, they're susceptible to manipulation and intra manipulation by 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 themselves. And yes. that's what's powering it. So if we see it as they are ideologically um, at one with each other and it, so it's not just um, an accidental uh, coalition. Um, and if we can understand that, and that's what I saw with Pat Buchanan in Putin's paleo conservative moment, uh, I sensed I could see the puppet strings. And now, since then, I looked into it a lot. There's a whole 
body of academic scholarship which has lo and behold concluded there is no such cultural war 